Well, my name is Mark Musser, and I've been a missionary now for 25 years in the former Soviet Union. I went to the Evergreen State College uh, to get my bachelor's, and that was a very radical school. So I learned all about environmentalism, Marxism, socialism, all of the things that are so popular today in our world. Uh, we studied it uh, wholeheartedly when I was uh, younger in those days. After that, I went to uh, Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. And then we went to Belarus for a year. I got married to my wife, Karen, before that. Well, we now have three children. They're all grown up. They're all living in the States. And uh, we were in Belarus uh, for a year. We then went to uh, Ukraine for six years. We then came home uh, in 2004. We started a, a church in Olympia, Washington. And uh, then I would go back and forth uh, to Ukraine, uh, other in Belarus uh, frequently, uh, you know, maybe two, three times a year doing mission work. I had a colleague that I worked with in Belarus and also in uh, Ukraine. And he moved to Ukraine and he's lived there ever since until the war broke out and they had to leave. And so uh, we were um, going back and forth to Ukraine. And then in 2018, we had a young man take over the church in Olympia, Washington. And so we decided to return back to the mission field. This time he went to Armenia. So we were there for three years and my wife worked as an international school teacher. And then, uh, then I could travel. And so that was sort of the, the plan. And, and that worked out great until the COVID crisis hit. And then, uh, <laughs> then it was a lot more difficult. But we did have a, a good opportunity to develop some ministries in Armenia, and, uh, which has been really good. And now this year, we're, are, we're in uh, Kazakhstan because uh, the school sent us here. And our plan was to move to Ukraine in June. But I don't think that's going to happen now. So we don't know what we're going to do. Uh, come June. That's a little bit about. Hi, Mark. Yes, that's a little bit about my history. Okay, so uh, could you just, I know, uh, what piqued my interest was you, you did an, an article looking at Prince Charles's um, sort of spiritual background, I suppose, and his beliefs, because as you know, uh, the British royalty tend to keep kind of quite uh, quiet about what they really think about things. And, well, you know, there's an important aspect to that, which is that uh, we, we mustn't be seen, from, from a royal point of view, mustn't be seen to be partial uh, around the world, saying one country is bad, another one good, etc. Because, you know, to keep those diplomatic channels open uh, uh, and to be judgmental about another country, however bad you might quite, you know, privately believe they are, uh, it could make a make a mess of diplomatic efforts by diplomatic staff, foreign office, etc., to uh, you know make deals with countries, to uh, particularly make peace deals with countries, trade deals, and this sort of thing. So the idea is that the head of state and the royal family should keep kind of quite well away from. Uh, aspects of religion and politics which can be so divisive now obviously prince charles uh, actually since he was um, you know middle-aged and quite young man has stepped outside that area he's made big pronouncements about uh, uh, for example uh, talking to plants uh, although you know that may have had a spiritual aspect of that uh, he's also made it clear that he doesn't want to be defender of the faith because he doesn't believe in a faith so on the spiritual side he's been uh, particularly particularly outspoken, uh, which suggests that maybe he's trying to change the way that the head of state operates in Britain. But anyway, I know you've written quite a lot about what you think his spiritual beliefs are, particularly with a very revealing speech that he did a few years ago, uh, I think it was about a decade ago or so, in Oxford. So can you just take us through what you make of uh, what his real thoughts are about the spiritual direction which he wants to take the United Kingdom? Well, I, you know, I, I don't know much about him personally, but I did, uh, I haven't studied him, I haven't studied his beliefs or anything like that, but I did listen to his speech that he gave in Oxford in 2010. And uh, what interests me about uh, his speech is that uh, in our own state in Washington, the state of Washington, where I grew up and where I worked at, I worked for the Building Industry Association of Washington at the time. And uh, we were struggling with all kinds of environmental rules and regulations, which were taking over our state. And um, that continues to be the case. It's been very uh, difficult with all of the environmental rules and all the things that have to be done uh, with regard to building houses. Uh, you know, what do you, you know, what do you do? 
water hits a roof, goes down into the gutter. Well, can I stop you right there, Mark? Sorry, yeah. can I stop you right there? Because a lot of people would suggest that actually we've made rather a mess of the environment and that we do need some pretty good laws in place in order to stop people being selfish, effectively, and messing things up for the rest of us. So that that was the point of his speech. And, and so here, here we are uh, struggling with all of the rules and all the things going on for a builder. And because of all of the supposed um, pollution that these things create, just when you, when you go out and build things and things of this nature, of course, the Industrial Revolution, all these things. So I wanted to listen to his speech because uh, I was just curious as to what he would have to say. And I was very surprised when he went through uh, his whole discussion about the dangers of industrialization and, you know, of course, the pollution that uh, inevitably goes with it, uh, he drifted off into areas of what I would call pantheism. And by pantheism, we mean that the Greek word pan means every, and then, of course, theism means God. So if you put those things together, you have pantheism. You know, God is everything. And uh, this is, uh, that's what pantheism means. God is a part of nature. So he never said that specifically used the word, but he kept on saying that things like all is one, you know, a God is infinite, but it was he was not, never outside. If you look biblically at the scriptures, you know, God is outside of the world that he made. He's outside of uh, the universe that he made. In fact, it says the heavens can't even contain him. He is so great. This speaks of his transcendence, which uh, Prince Charles was denying uh, throughout his entire presentation in oxford he never said as much but at least the you know the um the tenor you know the mood of the whole speech was against the idea of transcendence and he also included islam with this too i wanted to hear you know how how are we going to get islam into this green discussion that he wanted to give at oxford too in fact the the title of the speech i believe was islam and the environment um and so I, I, these things piqued my interest, and I wanted to hear what he had to say. And I was just very surprised. And not only did he um, ignore Christianity in terms of its beliefs and what it says about the environment, about ecology, uh, but he also he he made like one reference to the Garden of Eden and that man was supposed to be like a garden keeper, uh, and that was it. He denied that man was um, made in God's image, never discussed that, and that means that man is above nature. He is distinct from nature. In fact, it says in the Genesis text that God commanded Adam and Eve to rule over nature. And so that this was his responsibility and to subdue it. And this was even in the case in the original Garden of Eden. Okay, so that the Garden of Eden was planted, according to the Genesis account, and Adam was put into that garden. And then his responsibility was to subdue and fill the earth through a procreation, marriage and work. OK, and so the idea was he would take the wilderness and turn it into a garden and the Garden of Eden was his model. So that's sort of what you have, the ecological discussions from Genesis one to three, if you know, in a, in a nutshell, which he never really got into. And of course, because he wants us to be nice to nature, he doesn't want us to rule over nature. He thinks this is what has created the um, destruction of nature. Uh, yet he's a king. I mean, you know, it's kind of it's kind of interesting to be listening to this kind of stuff. But anyway, the the point is, we need to merge with nature. Okay, you need to commune with nature. This is part of uh, his his pantheistic vision, where God is everything, and as you merge with nature, you're going to commune with God. So the, this this was sort of the you know the big discussion. He wants people to get away from uh, the old science of empiricism. Uh, let's get into things. That let's enjoy. Uh, nature, let's enjoy, and as we enjoy nature, we will enjoy God. We will enjoy the ground of being, which he discussed. I thought was interesting, too, because that's usually a, a discussion coming from Heidegger, uh, the, you know, the German philosopher, the German Nazi philosopher, who was also an environmentalist. Very interesting. Um, you have all kinds of discussions about Islam into this, too. He was quoting all kinds of different passages from the Quran that were suggesting the same types of uh, things which I had never heard, and I'm, I'm very puzzled by this because my understanding is that Islam is very monotheistic, and which means it believes the transcendence of God, that it's not pantheistic at all. Uh, but I'm not an expert in that area. It's just that I've always understood that you know Islam is is monotheism. So this was strange to me that he, he you know, it's Christianity and Islam, he's going to ignore the transcendence of God. 
and focus well, on... Well, hang on, Mark, because I wonder if Prince Charles was with us now, he would probably say, well, what I was doing was I was pointing out both in the Bible and the Quran, parts of verses of both, which talk about humanity caring for creation. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's precisely what he was doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, it, it's a very selective. OK, so that, you know, if you're going to be consistent with with scripture, you, you can't do that. And if you're going to be consistent with the Quran, I would imagine uh, you can't do that either. But I don't know their exact, uh, you know, their exact reasoning on the transcendence of Allah. But I assume that he is transcendent. I mean, that's just my what I've always been taught. But I could be wrong on that particular issue. But I can't imagine that Allah is pantheistic. It's just very selective. And see, the whole point is to uh, it's kind of like a, what you would call like a oneism or a monism or a holism. You, you keep everything holistically inside the circle of life and you don't allow anything to interfere from the outside. If you allow interference from the outside, then that creates disruption, you know, disharmony. It creates pollution. You know, man is outside of nature, and all he does is empirically design uh, tools and mechanics and industry and, and ruins everything. This is part of the thing he wants to get away from. So, well, that some have also pointed out. Sorry, uh, some have also pointed out, Mark, that um, the, this whole sort of push against industrialization, you know, the, you, stopping people using fossil fuels, etc., which Charles is really at the forefront of globally, um, is being seen by many, for example, in China as uh, an attack on them, saying, well, you know, we managed to do, you know, in, in Britain and America, have had massive industries for centuries uh, and now you guys are trying to do industry it's not going to be allowed yes i know right so i mean this is they are concerned about uh, pollution and industry and they they are really worried in fact they're scared okay they're actually scared of if we allow the countries of africa for example or maybe even um you know places like even india places like this where, where you know you have some struggling third world economies, you know, okay, any third world country, if we allow them to fully industrialize, then this is going to lead to even bigger pollution problems than we have now. So th this has always been their concern, and they want to try to slow that down, make it more what you would call sustainable. And that's part of that holistic viewpoint of the world, which, you know, he was really expounding upon in his speech given at Oxford 10 years ago. It's all about holism, keeping the circle of life. You know, they, they don't allow, don't allow God to interfere with the transcendent and, and himself. Oh, you know, that's what they want. Okay, what about pantheism, though? For many people, they won't have come across that term. Um, well, what's the roots of it historically? What, you know, where can you point to periods of history or uh, particular uh, civilizations where uh, this was the belief system which was general, generally uh, in use? Because it seems, I think, it is something which is kind of ancient um, but uh, uh, has, has survived in some parts of the world too. So can you just take us through what are the sort of historical roots of this pantheistic idea? Well, why don't we, first of all, discuss, you know, the different theisms that, that's out there so people get an idea of the, the different contrasts. Okay, theism, and that's the Greek word theos, which means a belief in God. So we believe in a transcendent, personal, infinite God. That's, that's theism. Polytheism, that would be many gods. So poly means many, and theism, of course, would stand for God. That would be a very common view, especially with the ancient world, probably the most common world view of all was polytheism. There are many gods. Uh, then, then you have uh, atheism, which, you know, there's no God. Okay. So that, you know, they, a, a means without, so it means without God. And then you have, of course, uh, pantheism and pantheism, pan means every. And so theism, God is everything. And this, uh, this kind of goes back to ancient Greece, you know, in the times of maybe Aristotle, a little bit before, you know, they would use words like God, theos, but they had more of a pantheistic version of you know, who they viewed God to be. So God was a, a part of nature. You know, and then also God is evolving a little bit, too. So you've got the evolutionary theory is sort of caught up with this as well. Uh, Plato, he kind of had a, a backward view of evolution, but he still had kind of a, a pantheistic view of God, too. He never really got away from it, even though. Once in a while, it comes close, you know, to what you would call the Christian view of God. 
but but at the end of the day, you, you look at his writings, you you compare them all, it gets back to pantheism. They cannot separate God from creation. And this is what the Bible did. Uh, certainly the Old Testament, number one, which goes back, you know, long, you know, long time before even the Greeks. And then you have in the New Testament as well, the, the, what we call the creator creature distinction. And that's very important uh, for all the Christian theology and, and Christian doctrine and, and biblical ideas that so you have a creator. He is the absolute creator. He is transcendent. The heavens, even the heavens can't contain him. He is the cause of all things we see, including us. And so he is the only one that's independent. And remember, in the Old Testament, you have God's name given, I am that I am. And uh, that was given to Moses in in the Pentateuch. And so this is a name that's passed on down to um, the New Testament. And uh, even that same creature, creator distinction is also given in the New Testament as well. So uh, Paul, for example, he he dealt with the um, pantheist when he gave a speech in Athens in Acts 17. And it's interesting to me that Prince Charles in his speech, he quoted from the Stoics. Uh, and they were Greek uh, philosophers and they were pantheists. And they told everybody in those days that you need to live according to nature. See, so that, see, nature was their guide. And so there's no transcendent God that has revealed himself, you know, to you for you to know something uh, from the outside. And this is exactly what the Bible teaches, okay, that God has revealed himself from the outside in. When you deal well, with uh, okay, so so Charles um, yeah. is is saying this stuff. He would argue, I'm sure, he would say, "Well, what I'm doing is a, a bit like I said before. Actually, uh, is is on." I mean, we're seeing a lot of uh, animal species going extinct. Uh, we need to somehow get rid of this separation between man and, and animals uh, because it's man's superior, superiority over animals, which is being abused. And uh, as a result, this, this extinction, these, I mean, you know, there's this campaign called Extinction Rebellion as well, which is uh, you can understand why people would get annoyed when they see a whole species of animals going extinct. So, in a way, that what they're doing is they're trying to just trying to stop that. Surely. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I I know I I've been well aware of that whole discussion. That the problem with that number one is that species, you know, extinction. Okay, uh, in the historic past has been far worse than it is now. I mean, you've got, you know, of course the the whole evolutionary theory shows mass uh, mass extinction over time, and and. You've got lots of fossils all over the place. We see all kinds of uh, creatures that no longer exist. Okay, and so really the the so-called fossil record shows mass extinction from the past, which um, really is not something new. Okay, that we see today. I mean, it's it's not something which is um, unique to our own own world today. So that that would be one thing. As secondly, um, which is hard for us is that. And, you know, and, well, you know I, I'm, a, I'm a biblicist, and so I look, I look at things from a biblical point of view, and I, you know, I understand all the different views, environmentalism, pantheism, and, you know, ecology, and, you know, I, I've been a student of all those things. And so I know the arguments, you know, backwards and forwards, and I, I know what, you know, what they're trying to get at and what they're concerned about. But, you know, um, the, you know, the Bible is very interesting. It talks about, number one, okay, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, okay? Now, why, why were they kicked out of the garden? Well, it's this thing called sin, okay? And so they, they violated a command of God. And so they were forbidden to go back to the garden, okay? And so this idea that we're going to live in some kind of a nice garden, okay, that this is a fantasy, and it's, it's not going to take place. We live in a very fallen world. And I can show the fallen world from any point of view i mean you we can economically for crying out loud look at what's going on our, our every country in the world's in super debt right now it's just off the charts what's going on uh politically okay it's just nothing but fighting you know fighting over this fighting over that okay in the animal kingdom we've got the same types of things that we have in our, in our you know world in general the same types of things that, that happen politically you know fighting uh, also happens in the, the natural as well this, 
part of the world in well, which it certainly does. Although the Russians would argue that they uh, don't have any uh, uh, debt with the IMF anymore. Look, uh, just just to wind up, Mark. A lot of people talking about. Uh, the uh, potential for a, a cataclysm economically, militarily. But what do you think about these predictions of the end of the world? Any thoughts on that, finally? Well, I mean, the <laughs> environmentalism is, is a, they predict the end of the world, but they don't believe in the Bible, okay? And so, see, the apocalyptic view of the world, okay, th- this is a biblical concept. So, you, you know, the Bible, you have God as the creator, and then God as the finisher. OK, and so this is and the reason why is because he's transcended. He has power to do it and he has an, a, a plan in history, which he's going to work out. You know, he has a beginning. He created things. He has the middle in which Christ came and died for the sins of mankind, raised from the dead. And God has a final, you know, finality to it at the end of history. We call that the apocalypse. And people look forward to the apocalypse where God will execute justice, but also he will finally bring about uh, salvation. So the kingdom of God will, will come. And so that gives us a hopeful or, you know, orientation toward the future. Now, the environmentalists have that same hopeful look toward the future, but they're all worried about like global warming. OK, well, uh, so this has become like an apocalyptic worldview. You know, they borrowed these things from the Bible, but then they try to apply it to all the ecological things that are going on. And what happens is that they have an apocalyptic mindset. And so what they actually make the problems bigger than they really are. And this happens all the time. I, you know, the, the environmental movement is a very apocalyptic movement. They're trying to scare people to get people into action, doing all kinds of things. If you look more carefully and more soberly at what's going on uh, ecologically, you know, I would uh, – Bjorn Lomborg, you know, for example, has written lots of good things, how most of the things that environmentalists talk about are, are just uh, not true. They're, you know, they, they've apocalypticized all these things. So um, – you know, they borrow from the Bible, the Garden of Eden. They want to return to it, but yet they deny many important uh, biblical concepts like, you know, God has made, God is transcendent. God made man in his image. You know, God has a plan. We live in a fallen world. You're not going to be able to fix all the problems this side of the grave. I mean, we've got all kinds of things that need to be talked about that people don't talk about today because they're not biblically literate. So they take things from the Bible and distort it. And so now we've got the global warming apocalypse. It's going to ruin everything. Uh, you know, these types of things. Or, you know, back in the 70s, uh, the environmental movement was very apocalyptic. I remember as a kid, they're scaring us about this and scaring us about that. And all their predictions never came true. Okay. And even the ones that Charles talked about, 2010, he says something was going to happen by 2015. I forgot what it was in his speech. And of course, that never happened either. And then no one ever criticizes him for all the false prophecies that these, um, you know, that these uh, false prophets have made. You know, basically, if you were to line up the prophecies of the environmental movement in the last 50, 60 years, uh, they would be, they're, they're all charlatans. I mean, they're just not, they're not serious. I mean, there's so many false prophecies over and over again. And why we listen to them, I don't understand. It's just like crying wolf all the time. And you would think at some point people would realize, you know, this is just a bunch of foolishness, but we, they, it just never happens. You know, they, they, they have so much money and so much power. And the fact you've got the King of England, you know, pushing that kind of stuff shows you where the where the money is and where the power is. So environmental movement is run by very rich people and uh, they are they have no interest in people. They, they, they don't like people. So. Oh, I want to say at this point, I think that Prince Charles is not quite yet king. Uh, he's, he's, definitely got, he's definitely got ideas. But anyway, look, Mark, if people are interested in following your work, uh, maybe looking at some of your, I don't know if you've got um, videos people can watch or articles, which is where I first came across you. Where else can we find you? Well, uh, you can find me on rmarkmusser. So rmarkmusser.com. And I've written a couple of books, too. I wrote a book called Nazi Ecology, uh, and this uh, deals with the, the, the National Socialism and, its, and its, its ties to the Green Movement. So I wrote that book a number of years ago, and so that's available. R. Mark Musser, Nazi Ecology. The other book is a, is a Christian commentary on the book of Hebrews. So that book is called Wrath or Rest, Saints in the Hands of an Angry God. Hebrews is a very difficult book, uh, lots of different uh, discussions from that book, and people have argued this and argued that because it has some serious warnings in that book. So I, I tried to deal with um, 
a, a plausible answer to some of these difficult questions in the book of Hebrews. Yeah, well, you've piqued my interest even more with talking about Nazi ecology. What do we know about what their beliefs were with regards to ecology? Because I know, uh, for example, they wanted to do what you might now call rewilding, which is to bring back uh, lost species of giant uh, cattle, uh, wolves sort of thing back. So can you just give us an outline of Nazi, Nazi ecology, which is obviously something we should be keeping very sharp eye on? Well, uh, you know, the... The, the Nazis were, you know, it's, it's a complicated subject, okay, but everything that we see today, okay, in, our, in the environmental movement today was all presaged by National Socialism, so every aspect to it. Probably the most important aspect that, that the Nazis gave the environmental movement is what we would call sustainable development, so that they were actually the progenitors of it. So they had all kinds of sustainable development plans for, uh, you know, even after they took over the um, – the east, you know, they, they would conquer Western Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Hitler was going to cover Ukraine with windmills. Um, he was going to, they had all kinds of master plans, you know, garden cities were going to be designed uh, for all over the, you know, farming communities. Of course, they were going to have an economy. I'm sure that's, that's a good thing. It's better than covering it with factories. Well, they were going to have it uh, be more uh, sustainable. They were going to have factories there too, but it was going to be sustainable because, uh, both the capitalists and the communists, according to the Nazis, were so over-industrialized, they were, they were destroying the world. And so we need to have a more sustainable idea of how to do things. And, of course, uh, they were blaming the Jews for that, too. Uh, my, my book deals with the, the anti-Semitism was also a part of their uh, views of nature because the Jews were considered to be anti-nature. So I get into that discussion as well, which is actually the heart of the book. And it, so it deals with why the Holocaust had an environmental, um, you know, had environmental uh, connections to it. So it actually made the Holocaust even worse uh, because of its, you know, you look at some of the animalistic things that were going on. Well, it's because they had a, a very uh, strong views of nature. We need to, the laws of the jungle. You know, we, we are going to live according to what nature tells us. And, and of course, uh, survival of the fittest is what nature teaches us. And so we're going to uh, clean up uh, clean up the world by getting back to the laws of the jungle. So that, that was sort of their plan. And eugenics was a big part of that plan. You know, they were going to clean up the blood. And of course, along with, with that, they clean up the land. Uh, so they, they called it blood and soil. So you had uh, a German blood and German land. And, and you need to bring those things together holistically they were also big, uh, big on holistic ideas with the National Socialists. They were trying to get away from the Jewish ideas that separated, you know, uh, separated life, you know, from the world, you know, intellect from the from the world. They were trying to get away from that stuff, and so they brought about uh, lots of ideas about nature, uh, social Darwinism. You know, uh, this was sort of their primary bread and butter. And then underneath, of course, biology. You know, they they, they looked at uh, basically, politics as politically applied biology. I mean, you think about that, okay? That they that deals with eugenics, and so they were going to emphasize uh, biology, and uh, they were going to clean up the blood. And then, of course, uh, Hitler loved wolves. Okay, his favorite animal was uh, was the wolf, and and he was going to be the very wolf that was going to cull the herd. He was going to clean up the herd, and so you got all kinds of wolf imagery, uh, even from. You know, if, uh, he, for example, he liked to be called Uncle Wolf. I mean, that was the name that people gave him. Um, Nazi Germany was the first country in the world to protect wolves. Uh, you got the, of course, uh, the Volkswagen was made at the Wolfsburg uh, place. Um, I think his own secretary was like a, another head of, like she was Wolf, Ada Wolf or something. I can't remember the name of, she was like Miss Wolf or something. And then, of course, you've got the, um, you know, the uh, submarines. They were called the Wolfpack. OK. And then uh, he you know, Hitler called his SS, you know, guys out there, uh, he called them his pack of wolves. And very interesting that when the um, the SS got done with some of the, the death camps, you know, Sobibor, uh, Treblinka, and that they, they killed uh, up to, you know, a million, a little bit more than a million people in those two death camps. Uh, they planted wolf flowers on top of the Jewish graves after they got done. Lupin. So there's some uh, really evil uh, and sinister um, 
nature worship and uh, laws of the jungle, uh, you know, and we don't care about people uh, as really at the at the, you know, the underneath uh, the dark side of, of national social, which we all we all understand. But there was also an ideology of nature feeding into that that we haven't studied very well. So that's what my book does. I get into that discussion, trying to show how how it was and why it was. The Holocaust was so brutal. Just remind us of your, uh, of your of the title of your book and how people might be able to get hold of that particular one. A fascinating yeah, uh, it's, topic it's, to get into. And you can uh, just type in, you know, it'll be on Amazon. Just type in Google Nazi ecology, Mark Musser, and you can buy it in a lot of different places online. Okay. Okay, Mark Musser, thanks ever so much for joining us. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Cheers for your time, Mark. All the best. I'll send okay. you something on the werewolves too. Okay, yeah, I've heard about it, but I haven't, yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay, cheerio, bye.